Sue Sedai. Jim it up, sir. I'm Chelsea. I'm Emily. And we are the directors of The Vagina Monologues. Thank you so much for being with us today in the comfort of your homes, wherever that might be. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Phnom Penh Players. We are established in 1992, so a long time ago. And we became an organization that was just a bunch of expats getting together to more of a community that now raises money for the local community through NGOs and charities. Mm -hmm. And you will learn a little bit more about that later on. The show that we're putting on tonight was written by Eve Ensler, currently known as V, in 1996. Since then, it has been performed in over 140 countries. We have chosen to put it on today in 2021 because the messages are still relevant. Women worldwide are still fighting for some pretty basic human rights and striving daily to be respected in all of their complexities. Today on stage, you will see 22 women who we are in awe of. Absolutely. <laughs> representing 10 different countries. Their diversity, their unique cultures, identities, orientations, and very personal connections to those stories have formed an amazing and pretty powerful alliance. Now the Phnom Penh players would not be able to put this on if it weren't for our phenomenal sponsors. So we're gonna let you know who they are right now. First is our platinum sponsors, Anchor Research. And then our costumes were done by Armada by Abello. Our gold sponsors are The Vine Phnom Penh. And our silver sponsors are The Box Office and Beyond Design. We also had an amazing rehearsal space the Noisy Chili Tap House. And finally we have, but not least, we have five amazing brown sponsors who are Mono Palette, uh, Panam Climb, uh, Amatak, Panam Fen Fest, and, and Carolina Barbecue. Woo! <laughs> so thank you so much for being with us today and enjoy the show. Akunchiran. Akunchiran. Hi, I'm Matt. I'm one of the producers for the Vagina Malogs, and I'd just like to tell you that your donations go towards the Phnom Penh Players fundraising efforts. This year, that includes the Early Years Behind Bars project, uh, which is part of the Cambodian League for Promotion and Defense of Human Rights. They provide basic need for children, women, and pregnant women in prison, under the Cambodian law, children are allowed to stay in prison with their incarcerated mothers. It's not ideal, but occasionally it's their only option. They also provide support for children when they return to their relatives and communities. They protect children and pregnant women in prison from violations of their rights, all while promoting understanding and accountability. Every dollar helps during this trying time. So thank you for your donations and enjoy the show. I bet you're worried. Oh, we were worried. We were worried about vaginas. We were worried about what we think of vaginas, and even more worried that we don't think of them. We were worried about our own vaginas. They need a context, a community, and a culture of other vaginas. There is so much secrecy and darkness surrounding them, like the Bermuda Triangle. Nobody ever reports back from there. And in the first place, it's not so easy to even find your vagina. Women go weeks, months, sometimes years before even looking at it. A high-powered businesswoman was once interviewed and she said she didn't have the time. She was busy. Looking at your vagina, she said, is a full day's work. You have to get down there, on your back, in front of a mirror that's standing on its own, full length preferred. You have to get in the perfect position, in the perfect light, which then is shadowed somehow by the angle you're at. You get all messed up. You're arching your head up, killing your back. Oof, you're exhausted by then, right? Yeah. She said she didn't have the time. She was busy. So, there were the vagina interviews which became 
The Vagina Monologues. Over 200 women were interviewed. Older women, younger women, singled women, married women, lesbians, college professors, actors, corporate professionals, sex workers, black women, Asian American women, Native American women, Caucasian women, Jewish women. Okay, at first, women were reluctant to talk. They were a little shy. But once you got them going, you could not stop them. Women secretly love to talk about their vaginas. They get very excited, mainly because no one's ever asked them before. Now let's just start with the word vagina. It sounds like an infection at best, maybe a medical instrument. Medical instrument. Hurry, nurse, bring me the vagina. The vagina. The vagina. Oh, the vagina. vagina. Mm, no, no. Mm. It just doesn't sound like a word you want to say. It is a completely unsexy word. If you were trying to use it during sex, I don't know, trying to be politically correct. Darling, could you stroke my vagina? You'd kill the act right there. So we were worried about vaginas. What well, we call them and don't call them. In Great Neck, New York, they call it pussycat. A woman this than a mother used to tell her. Don't wear panties underneath your pajamas, dear. You need to air out your pussycat. In Westchester, they called it a hooky. In New Jersey, a twat. There's powder box, poochie, poo poo, pee pee, a poopaloo, a panel, a pen, and a piche. Well, there's a dishi, a dignity, a powder box, and a monkey box. Coochie Snorcher. Cooter. Lab. Gladys Siegelman. Don't they call it the VA? Mm, a VA, yeah. a wee wee, a horse pot, and a nappy dugout. Mongo, Mookie, Fanny Boom, Mushmallow. Do you mean marshmallow? Why not? Possible, Gooly, Tamale, Tortilla, Connie. A Mimi in Miami. A Splitnish in Philadelphia. A Schmend in the Bronx. A Beck Beck in the Philippines. In France, a Schneck. A Mushki in Germany. And in Australia, a Fanny or a, a Cunt. <laughs> in El Salvador, Coca, Pupusa, Miko. In Izibunu in South Africa. A Panocha in Mexico. And in Cambodia, a Piglet. Via me, uni, or a kadoi! We were worried about vaginas. Some of the monologues are based on one woman's story. Some of the monologues are based on several women's stories regarding the same theme. And a few times, a good idea became an outrageous one. This monologue is based on one woman's story. Although the subject came up in every interview and was often fraught, the subject being hair. Cannot love a vagina unless you love hair. Many people do not love hair. My first and only husband hated hair. He thought it was cluttered and dirty. He made me shave my vagina. It felt good to rub it and painful, like a mosquito bite, like the way a beard must feel. I refused to shave it again. Then my husband had an affair. When we went to marital therapy, he told me that it was because I wouldn't please him sexually. I wouldn't shave my vagina. The therapist had a German accent and gasped, with each sentence to show her empathy. She asked me why I didn't want to please my husband. I told her I thought it was weird. I felt little with my hair gone down there and I couldn't help talking in a baby voice and the skin got so irritated that even calamine lotion wouldn't help it. She told me that marriage was a compromise. I asked her if shaving my vagina would stop him from screwing around. I asked her if she'd had many cases like this before. She told me that 
asking questions diluted the process. That I just needed to just jump right in. She was sure it was a good beginning. That evening, when we got home, he got to shave my vagina. He nicked it a few times and there was blood in the tub, but he didn't care. He was so excited. Later, when I felt his spiky sharpness pressing against me as we were laying in bed, I realized something. The hair is there for a reason. There was no protection. There was no fluff. You have to love hair in order to love the vagina. It's the leaf around the flower, the lawn around the house. You can't pick and choose which parts you want. And besides, my husband never stops growing around. All the women were asked the following question. If your vagina could dress, what would it wear? Glasses, a beret, a leather jacket, silk stockings, mink, and a pink boa. A male tuxedo, jeans, something form-fitting. Emeralds, a taffeta gown, mm, sequins. Oh. Armani only. No, no. Armada only. A tattoo, see black through underpants. An evening gown. Something machine washable. Custom face mask, purple velvet pajamas, Angora, a red bow. Hmm. Sweatpants. Hmm. Animal print. Wow. Silk kimono. Ermine and pearls. A tattoo. Mm -hmm. An electrical shock device to keep unwanted strangers away. High heels, lace and combat boots, purple feathers, shells, cotton, a pinafore, a bikini, a sleeker. If your vagina could talk, what would it say? Two words. Slow down. Is that you? Feed me. I want. <laughs> yum, yum. Oh, yeah. Start again. No, over there. Lick me. Whoa, mama. Fuck me. Think again. More, oh, please. Embrace me. Oh. Let's play. Don't stop. That's better. Hey, remember me? Come inside. No, over there. Let's play. Yes, yes. <sighs> Enter at your own risk. Mm. Oh God, thank God, I'm here. Let's go, let's go. <sighs> Find me. Thank you. Bonjour, too hard, don't stop. Where's Brian? More, more. Yes, there. There. A group of women between the ages of 65 and 75 was interviewed. These interviews were the most poignant, possibly because many of them had never had a vagina interview before. One woman at 72 had never even seen her vagina. She'd wash herself in the shower and bath, but never with conscious intention. She had never had an orgasm. So at 72, she went into therapy, as they do in New York. And with the help of her therapist, she went home one afternoon by herself, lit some candles, took a bath, played some music, and she got down with herself. She said it took her over an hour because she was arthritic. But when she finally found her clitoris, she said she cried. This interview, it's for her. Damn dear. 
I haven't been down there since 1953. No, it had nothing to do with eyes and hair wiped down. It's a cellar down there. It's very damp. It's clammy. You don't want to go down there, trust me. You get sick, suffocating, very nauseating. The smell of the mildew and the clamminess and everything. Smells unbearable, gets in your clothes. No, there was no accident down there. It didn't blow up or catch on fire or anything. It wasn't so dramatic. I mean, well, never mind. No, never mind. I can't talk to you about this. What's a smart girl like you going around talking to old ladies about their deal years for? We didn't do this kind of thing when I was a girl. What? Okay. There was this boy. Andy Lefkoff. He was cute. Well, I thought so. And tall, like me. And I really liked him. He asked me out for a date in his car. I can't do this. I can't talk to you about this. Talk about down there. You just know it's there. Like the cellar. There's rumbles down there sometimes. You can hear the pipes and things get caught there. Little animals and things. And it gets wet. And sometimes people have to plug up the leaks. Otherwise, the door stays closed. You forget about it. Every house has to have one, but you don't see it or think about it. It has to be there, though, otherwise the bedroom would be in the basement. Andy. Andy went off. Andy was very good looking. He was a catch. That's what we called it in my day. He asked me out for a date in his car. It was a new white Chevy Bel Air. I remember thinking that my legs were too long for the seat. I had long legs. My knees were smushed up against the dashboard. I remember looking at my big kneecaps when he just kissed me in this take me by control, like they do in the movies kind of way. And well, I got excited. So excited. And well, there was a flood down there. I couldn't control it. It was this force of passion, this river of life just flooded right out of me, right through my panties, right onto the car seat of his new white Chevy villain. It wasn't he. And it was smelly. Well, frankly, I didn't smell anything, but he said, Andy said that it smelled like sour milk and it was staining his car seat. I was the stinky, weird girl. I tried to explain to him that I couldn't control it, that a kiss had caught me off guard. I tried to wipe the flood up with my dress. It was a new yellow primrose dress and it looked so ugly with the flood on it. Andy drove me home without saying another word. And when I got out and closed the car door, I closed the whole store, never opened for business again. Well, I dated some after that, but the idea of flooding made me too nervous. I used to have these dreams. Crazy dreams. Oh, they're dope. Why? Burt Reynolds. I don't know why. He never did much for me in life, but in my dreams. Oh, it was always Burt and I. Burt and I. Burt and I. It would always be the same general dream. We'd be out in some restaurants like the conscious in Atlantic City, all big with the chandeliers and the thousands of waiters with the best. Bert would give me all good croissants. I'd pin it on my blazer. We'd laugh. We were always laughing, Bert and I, laughing, laughing. We did shrimp cocktail, huge shrimp, fabulous shrimp. We'd laugh some more. We were very happy together. And then, right in the middle of the restaurant, he pulled me towards him and just as he was about to kiss me. The whole restaurant would start to shake. Pigeons would fly up from under the table. I don't know what those pigeons were doing there. And the flood would come right from down there. It would pour out of me. It would pour and it would pour. There'd be fish in it, in little boats. 
and Bert would be standing there, waist deep in it, looking horrified that I'd done it again. Horribly disappointed as his friends, Dean Martin and the like, swam past us in their tuxedos and evening gowns. I don't have those streets anymore. Not since they took away just about everything connected, but down there, moved out the gear to rest the tubes. It all had to go. The doctor thought he was being funny. He said, if you don't use it, you lose it. But really, we, uh, we found out it was cancer. Everything had to go. Who needs it anyway? Highly unnecessary. I've done other things. I love the dog shows. I sell antiques. What would it wear? What would it wear? What kind of a question is that? What would it wear? It would wear a big sign. Closed. Due to flooding. What would it say? I told you. It's not like that. It's not like a thing that talks. Stop being a thing that spoke a long time ago. It's a place. It's down there. It's a place if you don't go. Yeah, big. You got it out of me. You got an old lady to talk about it down there. I feel better. You know what? You were the first person I ever told about this. And I feel a little better. My vagina is a shell. A round pink tender shell that opens and closes close and open. My vagina is a flower, an eccentric tulip, the center acute and deep, the scent delicate, the petals sturdy but gentle. I did not always know this about my vagina. I learned this in a vagina workshop. I learned this from a woman who runs the vagina workshop, a woman who believes in vagina, who really sees vaginas, who helps other women see their own vaginas by seeing other women's vaginas. In the first session, the woman who runs the vagina workshop asked us to draw a picture of our unique, beautiful, fabulous vagina. That's what she called it. She wanted to know what our unique, beautiful, fabulous vagina looked like to us. So one woman who was pregnant drew a big red mouth, screaming with dollars spilling out. Another very skinny woman drew a big serving plate with um a kind of Devonshire pattern on it. I drew a huge black dot with little squiggly lines around it. The black dot was equal to a black hole in space and the little squiggly lines were meant to be people or things or just your basic autumn that got lost there. I had always thought of my vagina as an anatomical vacuum randomly sucking up people or things or just tiny things around it. <laughs> I did not think of my vagina in a practical or biological term. I did not, for example, think of my vagina as something attached to me. In the workshop, the woman who runs the vagina workshop asked us to take out our hand mirrors and to see our vagina. After careful examination, we were to verbally report to the group of what we saw. I have to tell you that up until this point, Everything I knew about my vagina was based on hearsay or invention. I did not see the thing. It had never occurred to me to look at it. My vagina existed for me on some extra plane. It seemed so reductive and awkward looking at it like we were in our workshop on our shiny little blue mats with our hand mirrors. <sighs> it reminded me of what the early astronomers must have felt with their primitive telescopes. I find it quite unsettling at first, my vagina. Like the first time you see a fish cut open and you discover this bloody complex world right inside under the skin. So red, so raw, so fresh. And the thing that surprised me the most was all the layers. Layers inside layers opening into more layers. My vagina amazed me. 
I couldn't speak when it came my turn in a workshop. I was speechless. I had awakened to what the woman who ran the vagina workshop called vaginal wonder. I just want to lay there on my mat with my legs spread, examining my vagina forever. It was better than a Grand Canyon, ancient and full of grace. It had the innocence and properness of an English garden. And it was funny, very funny. It made me laugh. It can hide and seek, open and close. <laughs> Then the woman who ran the workshop asked how many women in the workshop had had orgasms. Two women tentatively raised their hands. I did not raise my hand, but I had had orgasms. I didn't raise my hand because they were accidental orgasms. They happened to me. They happened in my dreams and I would wake in splendor. They happened a lot in water, mostly in the bath. I want some Cape Cod. They happen on horses, on bicycles, sometimes on the treadmill at the gym. <laughs> I didn't raise my hand although I had had orgasm because I didn't know how to make one happen. I thought it was a mystical, magical thing. I didn't want to interfere. It felt wrong. Getting involved, contrived, manipulative. It felt Hollywood. The surprise will be gone and this mystery. The problem, of course, was that the surprise had been gone for two years. I hadn't had a magical accidental orgasm for a long time and I was frantic. That's why I was in a vagina workshop. <laughs> then the moment had arrived that I both dreaded and longed for. The woman who ran the workshop asked us to take our hand mirrors again and to see if we could locate our clitoris. So we were there, the group of us women, on our backs, on our mats, looking for our spots, our focus, our reason, and I don't know why, but I started crying. Maybe it was sheer embarrassment. Maybe it was knowing that I had to give up the fantasy. The enormous, life-consuming fantasy that someone or something was going to do this for me. That someone was coming to lead my life, to choose direction, to give me orgasm. I could feel the panic coming. The simultaneous terror and realization that I had avoided finding my clitoris. That I had rationalized that mainstream and consumerist because I was terrified that I did not have a clitoris. Terrified that I was one of those constitutionally incapable, so one of those Frigid, dead, shut down, dry apricot, tasting bitter. Oh my God. I lay there with my mirror looking for my spot, look, reaching with my hands and all I could think about was when I was 10 and I lost my gold ring with the emeralds in the lake. How I kept diving over and over to the bottom of the lake and reaching with my hands over stones and fish and slimy stuff and bottle caps, but never my ring. The panic I felt, I knew I'd be punished. Oh. The woman who ran the workshop saw my insane scrambling, sweating, and heavy breathing. She came over. So I told her, It's gone! It's gone! I lost my clitoris! I should have wanted swimming! The woman who ran the workshop laughed. <laughs> she calmly stroked my forehead and she told me, My clitoris is not something that I could lose. It was me, she said. The essence of me. It was both the doorbell to my house and the house itself. I didn't have to find it, I just have to be it. Be it. Be my clitoris. Be my clitoris. I lay back down, closed my eyes, put my mirror down. I watched myself floating above myself. I watched as I slowly approached myself to re-enter. I felt like an astronaut re-entering the surface of the earth. It was very quiet, this re-entering. Quiet and gentle. I bounced and landed, landed and bounced. And I came into my own muscles and blood and cells. And then I 
fit into my vagina. It was suddenly easy and I fit. I was warm and pulsing and young and ready and alive. And with my eyes still closed, without looking, I put my finger on what has suddenly become me. I felt a little quivering at first, which urged me to stay. The quivering becomes a quake, an eruption, and layers dividing and subdividing. The quaking opened onto a plane of ancient horizon of light and colors and longing. I felt connection, calling connection as I lay there thrashing about on my little blue mat. My vagina is a shell, a tulip, and a destiny. I am arriving as I am beginning to leave. My vagina, my vagina is me. Kapat klay klay da bah yoni. Ko bom nong da bah klitris ke min kipar sat na. Ve ke chia sari deng kai tam muay kut, ve ke nong deng kai tam mu, dai bang kat lang nam bay tai phiep suo sai nong aram. បើនិយាយចាំទេវិគឺជាបណ្ដុំសរសៃប្រសាទជាច្រើនបើនិយាយចំឆ្នាំទៀតគឺវាជាបណ្ដុំសរសៃប្រសាទរហូតដល់ទ
in the park. They smashed my magic marker paint and nails. They even punched my lipstick mouth. Ugh. They beat the girl. 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 They, they beat, beat the, the girl, girl out of my boy. boy. Or mm, they tried. So I went underground. I stopped playing the flute. Be a man. Stand up for yourself. Go punch him back. <laughs> and grew a full beard. It was good. <laughs> I was big. You were big? Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and I even joined the Marines. Like, suck it up and drive on. Mm. I became Dula. Jaded. Sometime cruel. Butch it. Butch it. Butch, Butch it, it up. up. Always clenched. Inaccurate. Incomplete. I... Ran away from home. From school. From the boot camp. And guess what? I mm. ran to Miami. Mm. Greenwich Village. And Luch To New Orleans. <gasps> and I found gay people. Mm. Oh! <laughs> Wilderness lesbians. <gasps> I got my first horror shot. Mm. And got permission <laughs> to be finally myself. <laughs> To transition, to travel, to immigrate, 350 hours of the hot needles? Ugh, I would count the male party class they died. And 16 men he has gone. And the feminine, it's in your face. So I lift my eyebrows more. And if I'm curious, I ask questions. Oh, and my, and my voice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's all about Rexon and sing song, sing song, men, some monotone and flat. Southern accents is really excellent. Juvie's accents really help. Hello, my friends. Hello. Hi. <laughs> and my vagina, it's so much friendlier. I cherish it. The orgasm come in waves. Mm -hmm. And yes, before, there's such a jerk. <laughs> Well, <laughs> absolutely. And now, now, girls, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm the girl next door. Ooh. Hi, girl. Guess what? My lieutenant colonel father ended up paying for the vagina! vagina! Now, my mother, she wondered what people would think, that, that she made this happen. And then we went to church, and... Everyone said you have a beautiful daughter. Uh -huh. And from there, mm -hmm. I was allowed to be soft. I'm allowed to listen. To, I was able to, to receive. To be in the present tense, people are so much nicer to me now. So much nicer. Yeah, and Aww. in the morning, I can put my hair up in a ponytail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a wrong was righted. I am right with God. It was like when you're trying to sleep and there's a loud car alarm. And when I got my vagina, oh, it was like someone finally turned it off. <laughs> beep, beep. Oh. <laughs> I live now. We all live now in female zone. But you know how they feel about immigrants. They don't like it. They don't like it when you come from someplace else. They don't like it when you mix. They even killed, yes, they killed my boyfriend. They beat him insanely as he slept with a baseball bat. They were trying to beat this girl out of his head. They don't want him dating a foreigner, even though she's pretty, even though she's kind, she's smart, she's strong. They don't want him falling in love in ambiguity, like a trans woman. They were scared. He'll get lost. They were that terrified of love. They, they were, were that, that terrified, terrified of, of love. love. The following monologue is based on an interview with a woman who had a good experience with a man because he likes to look at it. This is how I came to love my vagina. It's embarrassing because it's not politically correct. 
I mean, I know it should have happened in a bar with salt grains from the Dead Sea in your playing, me loving my woman's self. I know the story. Vaginas are beautiful. Our self-hatred is only the internalized repression and hatred of the patriarchal culture. It isn't real. Pussies unite. I know all of it. Like, if we'd grown up in a culture where we were taught fat thighs were beautiful, we'd all be pounding down milkshakes and Krispy creams, lying on our back, spinning our days, thigh expanding. But we didn't grow up in that culture. I hated my thighs, and I hated my vagina even more. I thought it was incredibly ugly. I was one of those women who looked at it, and from that moment on, wished I hadn't. It made me sick, and I pitied anyone that had to go down there. So, in order to survive, I began to imagine there was something else between my legs. I pictured furniture. Cozy futons with soft cotton comforters, little velvet settees, shag rugs, or pretty things. Silk chromas, quilted potholders or place settings. I got so accustomed to this that I lost all memory of having a vagina. Whenever a man was inside me, I pictured him wrapped in a chiffon scarf or in a Chinese bowl. And then I met Bob. Bob was the most ordinary man I'd ever met. He was thin and tall and nondescript and wore cocky tan clothes. He did not like spicy food or listen to Prince and he had no interest in sexy lingerie. He did not share his inner feelings. No, he had no issues or problems and was not even an alcoholic. He wasn't very funny or articulate or mysterious. He wasn't mean or unavailable. He didn't drive fast. I didn't particularly like Bob. I would have missed him altogether if he hadn't picked up my change that I dropped on the daily floor. As he handed me back those quarters and pennies and his hand accidentally touched mine, something happened. I went to bed with him. And that's when the miracle occurred. You see, Bob loved vaginas. He was a connoisseur. He loved the way they tasted, the way they smelled, the way they felt. But most importantly, he loved the way they looked. He had to look at them. He told me so the first time we had sex. I have to see you, he told me. I'm right here. No, you, he says. I have to see you. Turn on the light, I said, thinking he was a weirdo and freaking out in the dark. So he turns on the light and says, okay, ready, ready to see you. I'm right here, Bob. I'm right here. And then Bob began to undress me. Whoa, hmm. what are you doing, Bob? I need to see you, he says. No need, just, just do it. I need to see what you look like. But you've seen a red leather couch before, Bob. But Bob continued, he, he would not stop. He wanted to throw up and die. This is awfully intimate, Bob. Can't you just do it? No, he tells me, it's who you are. I need to look. So I held my breath, and he looked, and he looked. He got breathy, and his face changed. He didn't look ordinary anymore. He looked like a hungry beast. You're beautiful, he tells me. You're elegant and deep and innocent and wild. You saw that down there. It was as if he'd read my palm. I saw that and more, much more. 
Bob stayed looking for almost an hour as if he were studying a map or observing the stars or looking into my eyes, but it was my vagina. And I watched him there looking at me and he was so genuinely excited, so peaceful and euphoric that I began to get wet and turned on. I began to see myself where he saw me. <laughs> I began to feel beautiful and delicious like a great painting or a waterfall. Bob wasn't afraid. He wasn't grossed out. I began to swell. I began to feel proud. I began to love my vagina. And Bob lost himself there, but I was there with him in my vagina. And we, we were gone. This is a non-happy fact found in the UNICEF Report 2013, Female Genital Mutilation and Cutting, and a statistical overview and exploration of the dynamics of change. Female genital mutilation has been inflicted in about 200 million girls and young women in 30 countries where it is practiced, mostly in Africa. Within the next decade, 30 million girls at a risk of the knife, a razor, a glass shard. To cut their clitoris or remove it altogether. In a man, it would range as the amputation of most of the penis to the removal of all of the penis. Short term results. Tetanus, hemorrhages, cuts in the urethra, vaginal walls, and bladder. Long term. Chronic uterine infections, agony and danger during the childbirth. Early death. Overall, however, overall, is on the decline with the percentage of girls aged 15 to 19 who had been caught from 51% in 1985 to 37% today. My vagina's angry. It is. It is pissed off. My vagina's furious and it needs to talk. It needs to talk to you. It needs to talk about all this shit. I mean, what's the deal? An army of people out there thinking of ways to torture my poor ass, gentle, loving vagina. Spending their days constructing psycho products and nasty ideas to undermine my pussy. Vagina motherfuckers. All this shit they're trying to shove up us, clean us up, make it all go away. Well, I hate to tell you this. My vagina's not going away. It's pissed off and it's staying right here. Like tampons, for example. What the hell is that? A dry wad of fucking cotton stuffed up there. I don't know why they can't find a way to suddenly lubricate the tampon, huh? As soon as my vagina sees it, it goes into shock. It says, forget it, forget it. It closes up. You know, you have to work with the vagina, introduce it to things, prepare the way. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what we call foreplay. You have to convince my vagina, seduce my vagina, engage my vagina's trust. And you can't do that with a dry water of fucking cotton. Stop shoving things up me. Stop shoving and stop cleaning it up. It does not need to be cleaned up. It smells good already. Don't try to decorate. Don't believe him when he tells you that it smells like rose petals when it's supposed to smell like pussy. 
That's what they're trying to do. Trying to clean it up. Make it smell like a bathroom spray or a garden. All those douche sprays. Floral, berry, rain. I don't want my pussy to smell like rain. All washed up like cleaning a fish after you've cooked it. I want to taste a fucking fish. That's why I've ordered it. Then there's those exams. Who thought of them? There's got to be a better way to do those exams. Why the scary paper dress that scratches your tits and crunches just like I'm a water paper someone threw away, huh? Why the rubber gloves? And why the flashlight all up there like Nancy drew against gravity, huh? Why the nasty stale syrups and those mean cold duck lips that they shove up inside you, huh? What the hell is that? My vagina is angry about those visits. It gets defended weeks in advance, I tell you. Does not even want to go out of the house. And then at the time comes, you get there. Don't you just love it? Scoot down, relax your vagina. Why? So that you can shove up mean cold duck lips inside of it? I don't think so. Why can't they find some nice purple velvet and wrap it around me? Lay me down some feathery cotton spread or use some friendly, um, whatever color you want gloves. Rest my tired feet up some feather fur or fur covered stirrups. Warm up the duck lips. Work with my vagina. But no, more tortures. Dry water fucking cotton, mean cold duck lips, and thong underwear. That's the worst. Thong underwear moves around all the time and gets stuck in the middle of your crusty butt. I mean, vaginas need to be loose and wide, not held together. That's why girdles are so bad. Need to spread and move and talk and talk. Vaginas need comfort. Make something like that. Make something that gives them pleasure. But no, of course not. Hate to see a woman have pleasure, particularly sexual pleasure. Now here's an idea probably a lucrative one too. Why not make a nice pair of cotton underwear with a French tickler belt inside it? Women would be coming all day long, coming in the supermarket, coming in the tuk-tuk, coming in the moto, coming in the bar, hot coming vaginas. They won't be able to stand it. Those energized, not taking shit, hot, happy vaginas. If my vagina could talk, it would talk about itself like me. It would talk about other wonderful vaginas. It would even do vagina impressions. What would it wear? It would wear Harry Winston diamonds, no clothing, just there all draped in diamonds. Of course, it's Queen V. My vagina helped release a giant baby. It thought it would do more of that. It's not. Instead, it wants to travel. Doesn't want a lot of company. Wants to read and know things and get out more. It wants sex. It loves sex. It wants to go deeper. It's hungry for depth and Johnny Depp. It wants change. It wants freedom. It wants silence and gentle kisses and warm liquids and soft touches. And speaking of kisses, it wants chocolate. It wants to scream. 
It wants to stop being angry. It wants change. It wants to want. It wants to come. My vagina. My vagina. Well, it wants everything.
Bosnian women refugees were interviewed during the war in Yugoslavia in refugee camps and centers. 20 to 70,000 women were raped in the middle of Europe as a systematic tactic of war. It was shocking to see how little people did to stop it. But then again, in Cambodia, more than 20% of surveyed men reported they have raped a woman or a child, which is another kind of war. This monologue is based on one woman's story. We do it tonight for that woman and the extraordinary women of Bosnia, Kosovo, and Cambodia. My vagina was green. Water soft, pink fields, cow mooing, sun resting, sweet, boyfriend touching lightly with a soft piece of blonde straw. There's something between my legs. I do not know what it is. I do not know where it is. I do not touch. Not now, not anymore, not since. My vagina was chatty. Can't wait so much, so much saying words, talking. Can't quit trying, can't quit saying, oh yes, oh yes. Not since I dreamed there's a dead animal sewn in there with thick black fishing line and the bad dead animal smells cannot be removed. And its throat is slit and it bleeds through all my summer dresses. My vagina singing all girl songs, all goat bell ringing songs, all wild autumn field songs, vagina songs, vagina home songs. Not since the soldiers put a long steel rifle up inside of me. So cold, the steel rod canceling out my heart. I don't know whether they're gonna fire it or shove it through my spinning brain. Six of them monstrous doctors with blast masks on, shoving bottles up inside me. There were sticks and the end of a broom. My vagina. Swimming, river water, clean, spilling water over sun-baked stones, over stone clit, clit stone, over and over. Not since I heard the skin tear and make a lemon screeching sound. A piece of my vagina came off of my hand, a piece of the lip. Now one side of my lip is completely gone. My vagina, a live, wet, water village. My vagina, my hometown. Not since they took turns for seven days, smelling like feces and smoked meat. They left their dirty sperm inside of me, and I became a river of poison and pots, and all the crops died, and the fish. My vagina, a live, wet water village. They invaded it, butchered it, and burned it down. I do not touch now. I do not visit. I live someplace else now. I do not know where that is. Hey, Ben, I get on it. No. Oh, Ben, I can play. I learned my mother. Oh. Ừ, oh, hai ngày muốn hành bẹp Sport Clay Ừ, ngày ừ. Sport Clay đó á ừ. Cho người thay hành chạy Sport Clay bao nhóm á Vì mà mình chỉ Sport and Joy Vì mình chỉ Sport Nha Để thay nhóm chọn ba, nhóm chọn ai được nhóm hết chứ Ừ, ừ. thở ấy Hai Sport Clay nhóm Mình mến xong tiền thóng ừ. Nhưng mà chẳng là hành hành vị chánh Thở ấy, là tiền vị chó hết Ừ, ừ. nạ cái áo ấy Ừ, em phải hả Sport Clay khá nhóm á Vui mà mẹn hai thơ sợp chứ bạp ai này ai mà đồng lộ khá nhóm bạp nè Mẹ ta bỏ rồi Tụ bây bì nó khá nông tả lá ca chạc với đôi chân hả bạn ta lỡ Nó khá nông tả lá ca thơm mây mà đôi chân tiền tê Chọn con các ông mà chúng vất tự chung đây Ơ mà chúng vất tự chung đây Thở đây thở đây Hai sự phụ khơi nhóm Nhị tứ Vì bạn ăn ở nhà thơ ai quầy quầy chung mình khôn dơ đấy Bạn đăng Ban khơi, ban vô Hay mỗi tiếp với mình chỉ thật khó tăng để thay khi ông chăng 
nhưng nhưng chẳng ai nhưng chẳng ba được nhưng mày sợ đâu ấy mở nó chứ cứ ấy mở mở lên ấy làm chật màn phải đầy ấy đúng rồi vậy mà nữa pi chín năm anh tiếc ô ô ô ô ô lồi mày thế ừ hai nhung phe hai nhung phe mày đã mất đã mất đã mất nhung phe vậy giờ bốc hơi khi nhung á vị trí cả chồng to à khi nhung mà mấy anh này anh mà bấm hơi khi nhung mà này hai nhung phe một tiếng chồng chồng mày dơ chồng bạn giờ bốc hơi khi nhung á Mày chia đỏ bác nhau Mày cho mùi tiền mà dừng Sao mà hai dơ dừng Sao mà hai dơ dừng Hai sắp bất khả nhóm Tạm bất chia phía bà đi kì đi mong á Nhóm chô lỡ đây á Chô lỡ đây Chô lỡ đây mong á Chô lỡ đây Đăng mấy cái Đăng mấy cái Thầy 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 Nhóm xa Ê Ê Ê Ê Ê Ê Ê Ê Hãy vậy tới sự bất lợi nhóm vì cái chuyện cá rồi đó còn tập này sẽ trời bảo dưỡng nữa nhé hay em sẽ bật cả thay trẻ lời ní á lời thằng nào nữa lời nào ừ lời nào ừ vì mày vì cái chuyện bật tê này thôi rồi sự trời dưỡng rồi sự trời dưỡng này rồi anh chồng nhóm phe nhóm phe nhóm đặt cả chồng đó đã sân bóng sự bất lợi cái nhóm á Chị tất xa mọi Ừ, anh đi hả? Chị trời cổ bố Trời ơi Ui, tốn ơ hề Chị bà xây Sài trí Mà đi hả? Làm mà Anh như vậy mình thầm mùi tiền đây ta mùi tiền Tốn ơ hề Chị rốt phương Chị đó tí cron ngọt Tí cron ngọt Tí cron nà Bên dường Mà mà bì nà Mà mà bì xa ăn hả chả Bên bên Mẹ sẽ có tí cắm nhỉ? Ê mà đáy lạc Lạc bì nè Lạc bì nè Lạc bì nè Hay Mình tiết sự sự bất khả lấy nhóm Vì cư chì Cá phát đuôi bắt đàm Hay cư chì Cho cả đặc thay bắt Thay bắt mà bắt lấy bỏ nhóm Ui sẽ khai lý kẻ xe mẹ nè Vì cư chì cả một vợ khá luôn Ồ Mẹn เจ้าไฮเฮงโกโอ้เจ้าหอมอ่ะเจ้าหอมอ่ะเจ้าหอมเฮงโกเจ้าหอมอ่ะเจ้าหอมเฮงโกเจ้าหอมอ่ะเจ
Memory, seven years old. Eggmontane, who is tan, gets angry at me and punches me with all his might between my legs. It feels like he breaks my entire self. I limp home. I can't pee. My mama asked me, what's wrong with my coochie snarcher? And when I tell her what Eka did to me, she yells at me and says to never let anyone touch it down there again. I try to explain that he didn't touch it, mama. He punched it. Memory, nine years old. I play on the bed, bouncing and falling, and impale my coochie snarcher on the bedpost. I make high-pitched screaming noises that come straight from my coochie snarcher's mouth. I get taken to the hospital, and they sew it up down there from where it's been torn apart. Memory, 10 years old. I'm at my father's house and he's having a party upstairs. Everyone's drinking. I'm playing alone in the basement and I'm trying on my new cotton white brown panties that my father's girlfriend gave me. Suddenly, my father's best friend, this big man, Alfred, comes up from behind and pulls my new underpants down and sticks his big hard penis into my coochie snarcher. I scream! I can't! I try to find him up and he already gets it in! My father's dead in and he has a gun and there's a loud horrible noise and then there's blood all over Alfred and me! Lots of blood! I'm sure that my coochie snarcher is finally falling out. Alfred is paralyzed for life. And my mama doesn't let me see my father for seven years. Memory, 13 years old. My coochie snorcher is a very bad place. A place of pain, nastiness, punching, invasion, and blood. It's a sight from mishaps. It's a bad luck zone. I imagine a freeway between my legs and I'm traveling going far away from here. Memory, 16 years old. There's this gorgeous 24 year old woman in our neighborhood. I stare at her all the time. One day, she invites me into her car. She asks me if I like to kiss boys and I tell her I do not like that. Then she tells me she wants to show me something and she leans over and kisses me so softly on the lips with her lips and then puts her tongue in my mouth. Wow. She asks me if I want to come over to her house and then she kisses me again, tells me to relax, to feel it to let our tongues feel it. She asked my mama if I can spend the night. And my mother's delighted that such a beautiful, successful woman has taken an interest in me. I'm scared and I can't wait. Her apartment's fantastic. She's got it hooked up. It's the 70s, the beads, the fluffy pillows, the mood lights. 
I decide right there that I want to be a secretary like her when I grow up. She makes a vodka for herself, and then she asks what I want to drink. I say the same as she's drinking. And she says, she doesn't think my mama would like me drinking vodka. I say she probably doesn't like me kissing girls either. And the pretty lady makes me a drink. Then she changes into a chocolate satin teddy. She's so beautiful. I always thought dykes were ugly. I say, you look great. And she says, so do you. I say, but I only have this white cotton bra and underpants. Then she dresses me slowly into another satin teddy. It's lavender like the first soft days of spring. The alcohol has gone to my head and I'm loose and ready. There's a picture over her bed of a naked black woman with a huge afro. She gently and slowly lays me out on the bed. Just how body's rubbing makes me come. Then she does everything to me and my coochie snarcher that I always thought was nasty before. Well, I'm so hot, so wild. She says, your vagina, untouched by man, smells so nice, so fresh. Wish I could keep it that way forever. I get crazy wild, and then the phone rings, and of course it's my mama. I'm sure she knows. She catches me at everything. I'm breathing so heavy, and I try to act normal when I get on the phone, and she says to me, what's wrong with you? Have you been running? I say, no, mama, exercising. Then she tells the pretty lady to make sure I'm not around any boys. And the lady tells her, trust me, there are no boys around here. Afterwards, the gorgeous lady does everything to me and my coochie snorcher. She makes me play with myself in front of her and teaches me all the different ways to give myself pleasure. She's very thorough. She tells me to always know how to give myself pleasure so that I'll never have to rely on a man. In the morning, I'm worried that I've become a butch because I'm so in love with her. She laughs, but I never see her again. I realized later that she was my surprising, unexpected, and politically incorrect salvation. She transformed my sorry ass coochie snorcher, raised it into a kind of heaven. We've created a list of vagina friendly cities. Welcome Phnom Penh. They are wild about vaginas in Pittsburgh. In fact, one woman from Pittsburgh was so obsessed with a particular word, a pejorative word used to describe the vagina. Her mission, to reconceive the word. I call it cunt. I've reclaimed it for all you ladies. Cunt. I really like it. Cunt. Listen to it. Cunt. C. C. Ca. Ca. Captivate. Cavern. Carefree. Cute. Clit. Come close. See closed inside 
inside Ka. Then you. Then Ka. Curvy inviting you. Undress. Under. Up. Urge. Ugh. Ugh. You. Then N. Then Con. Snug letters fitting perfectly together. N. Nest. Now. Nexus. Naughty. Nice. Nice. Always depth. Always round and uppercase. Con. Con. A jagged, wicked electric pulse. And then, and then, and then a soft end. A warm end. Con. Con. Then T. Then sharp, certain, tangy T. Texture. Take. Tight. Tensing. Tantalizing. Tasty. Turtle. Time. Tactile. Tyrannosaurus. Tell me. Tell me. Cunt. Cunt. For those of you watching at a distance, help me reclaim it. Cunt. Say it. Cunt. 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 Say it. Cunt. 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 A six-year-old girl was asked, if your vagina got dressed, what would it wear? Sunglasses. Or a chroma worn like a cape. If it could speak, what would it say? Uh, it would say words that begin with B and T. Turtle and violin are examples. What does your vagina remind you of? Um, a pretty dark peach. Or a diamond from a treasure I found. A treasure? And it's all mine. <laughs> okay. What's so special about your vagina? Somewhere deep inside, it has a really, really smart brain. Smart brain. What does it smell like? Snowflakes. Sex workers, they have rich, compelling, and complex relationships with their vagina. This particular woman, she blows my mind. She's a sex worker, but only did sex work with women. I love vaginas. I love women. I do not see them as separate things. Women pay me to dominate them, to excite them, to make them come. I did not start out like this. No, to the contrary, I started out as a lawyer. But in my late 30s, I became obsessed with making women happy. It started out as a mission of sorts. But then I got involved in it. I got rather good at it. Kind of brilliant. It was my art. I started getting paid for it. It was as if I had found my calling. I wore outrageous outfits when I dominated women. Silk, lace, leather. I used props, whips, handcuffs, ropes, dildos. There was nothing like this in tax law. There were no props, no excitement, and I hated those blue corporate suits. Although, 
I wear them now from time to time in my new line of work, and they serve quite nicely. There were no props in corporate law. There was no wetness, no dark mysterious foreplay, no erect nipples, no delicious smells, but mainly there was no moaning. Not the kind I'm talking about anyway. This was the key I see now. Moaning was the thing that ultimately seduced me and got me addicted to making women happy. When I was a little girl and I would see women in the movie making love, making strange orgasmic moaning noises, I used to laugh. I got strangely hysterical. I couldn't believe such loud, ungoverned, unjustified sounds were coming out of a woman. I longed to moan. I practiced in front of a mirror, moaning in various keys, various tones. But whenever I played it back, it sounded fake. It was fake. It wasn't rooted in anything sexual, really. Just my deep desire to be sexual. But then, when I was 10, I had to pee really, really badly once. On a car trip, it lasted for almost an hour. And when I finally got to pee in this dirty little gas station, I was so excited. I moaned. I moaned as I peed. I couldn't believe it. Me moaning in a Texaco station in the middle of Louisiana. I realized right then that moans were connected with not getting what you want right away. But with putting things off, I realized right then that moans were best when they came up and surprised you. They came out of this hidden, mysterious part of you that was speaking its own language. I realized that moans were in fact that language. I became a moaner. It made most men anxious. Frankly, it terrified them. I was loud. They couldn't concentrate on what they were doing. They'd lose focus, and well, ladies, they lose everything. We couldn't make love in people's homes. The walls were too thin. I got a reputation in my building and people stared at me with contempt in the elevator. Men thought I was too intense. Some called me insane. I began to feel bad about my moaning. I got quiet and polite. I made noise into a pillow. I learned to choke my moan, hold it back like a sneeze. I started to get headaches and stress-related disorders. I was becoming hopeless. Oh. When I discovered women, I discovered that most women loved my moaning. But more importantly, I discovered how deeply excited I got when other women moaned. When I was responsible for other women moaning. I made love to quiet women. And I found this place inside of them, and they shocked themselves with their moan. I made love to moaners, and they found a deeper, more penetrating moan. It was a type of surgery, a type of delicate science. Finding the temple, the exact location, or home of the moan. That's what I called it. Sometimes I found it over a woman's jeans. Sometimes I snuck up on it. Off the record, quietly disarming the surrounding alarms and moving in. Sometimes I used force. But not violent, oppressing force. No, more like dominating. I'm going to take you someplace, lay back and enjoy the ride. Kind of force.
Sometimes it was simply mundane. I found the moan before things even started. While we're eating salad or chicken, just casual, just right there with my fingers, here it is like that, real simple, in the kitchen, all mixed in with the balsamic vinaigrettes. Sometimes I use props. Did I mention? I loved props. Sometimes I made the woman find her moan in front of me. I waited, stuck it out until she opened herself. I was not fooled by the minor, more obvious moans. No, no. I pushed her further, all the way into her power moan. There's the clip moan. Oh, oh. There's the vaginal moan. Oh, oh. There's the combo clip vaginal moan. Oh, oh. There's the almost moan. Oh, oh, oh. There's the right on it moan. Oh, oh, oh. There's the elegant moan. There's the Joan Jet moan. Oh, oh, yeah. There's the wasp moan. There's the Miley moan. I came in like a wrecking ball. There's the Kamai moan. Ja, ja, ja. There's the black moan. Oh, shit. Oh, shit, girl. There's the Irish Catholic moan. Forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, I have sinned. There's the mountaintop moan. Yodelay, 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 hee hoo -ah. There's the tinder moan. Left, wait, left, left, right, 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 super like. There's the doggy moan. There's the uninhibited militant bisexual moan. Oh, oh, oh. There's a lockdown moan. Oh, oh, oh. Orgasm postponed. There's the machine gun moan. Uh. There's the tortured Zen moan. Um, 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 there's the diva moan. And I, there's the backpacker moan. Oh, oh, shh. Everyone in the hostel is going to hear, oh, 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 why'd you pick the top bunk? Oh. Pass me my elephant pants, please. And finally, there's the surprise triple orgasm moan. Oh, 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 oh,
piece was performed for some time without any mention of birth, which was a bizarre omission. But then again, a male journalist recently asked, what's the connection? Our author, Eve Enslow, was present for the birth of her granddaughter. She was in awe of vaginas before that moment. She's in deep worship now. I was there in the room when her vagina opened. We were all there, her mother, her husband and I, and the nurse from the Ukraine with her whole hand up in there in her vagina, twisting and turning and filling with her rubber glove as she talked casually to us, like she was turning on a loaded faucet. I was there in the room when the contractions made her crawl on all fours, made unfamiliar moans just leak out of her pores, and still there after hours, when she just screamed suddenly, wild arms striking at the electric air. I was there when her vagina changed from a shy sexual hole to a sacred vessel, to a Venetian canal, an archeological tunnel, to a deep well with a tiny child stuck inside. I saw the colors of her vagina. They changed. Saw the bruise broken blue, the blistering tomato red, the gray pink, the dark. Saw the blood-like perspiration around the edges. Saw the white yellow liquid, the shit, the clots, pushing out all the holes, pushing harder and harder. Saw through the hole. <laughs> the baby's head, scratches of black hair just there behind the bone, like a hard, round memory. As the nurse from the Ukraine kept on turning and turning her slippery hand. I was there when each of us, her mother and I, held a leg and spread her wide open, pushing with all our strength against her pushing. As her husband was sternly counting, one, two, three, telling her to focus harder. We looked at her then. We couldn't get our eyes out of that place. We forget the vagina, all of us. What else could explain our lack of awe, our lack of reverence? I was there when the doctors reached in with Alice in Wonderland spoons and there when her vagina became a wide operatic mouth, singing with all its strength. First the little head, then the gray flopping arm, then the fast swimming body, swimming quickly into our weeping arms. I was there later when I just turned and I looked at her vagina. I stood and I let myself see her all spread, completely exposed, mutilated, swollen, and torn, bleeding all over the doctor's hands. He was calmly sewing her there. And suddenly, her vagina became a wide, red, pulsing heart. The heart is capable of sacrifice. And so is the vagina. It can forgive and repair. It can change its shape to let us in. It can expand to let us out. So can the vagina. It can ache for us and stretch for us and die for us. And it can bleed and bleed us into this difficult, wondrous world. I was there in the room I remember. I am over rape. I'm over women, cisgender, transgender, and gender nonconforming, having to tell their stories over and over, traumatizing and re traumatizing over and over when the stories and the names and the identities of our perpetrators remain protected and anonymous.
I am over rape culture, where privileged men with political and physical power can take what they want, when they want, whenever they want, as much as they want it. And this includes former predator-in-chief Donald Trump, who was elected in 2016 after bragging about grabbing women by the pussy and who has over 15 cases of abuse against him. Brett Kavanaugh, Bill Cosby, President Duterte, Andrew Cuomo. The list is endless. It's not enough for them to lose their job and walk away with millions. Sexual assault is already illegal. I am over how long it takes anyone to ever respond to rape and how long corporations and partners protect abusers through payouts and backroom deals. Fuck you. Because if that same president or CEO stole money from you or killed someone, you can bet that they would be fired on the spot and he would be charged in court. I am over the fact that three out of four women experience sexual harassment and are afraid to tell anyone for the fear of losing their jobs or not being believed. I am over 67% of Cambodian women that are being led to believe that they should tolerate violence to keep their families together. I am over that 45% of Cambodian men who believe that they are entitled to sex regardless of their partner's consent, according to a 2016 UN survey of 10,000 men. I am over women being slowly made insane and angered and shamed and humiliated by being forced to ignore, deny, block out, tolerate, and minimize the sexual harassment in order to survive. I am over the fact that domestic helpers are being used as sex slaves. I am over undocumented workers being raped and sexually assaulted and then having nowhere to turn for protection or justice. I am over room attendants having to fight to get panic buttons installed on their beings because they can barely bend over to clean the bathtub without being sexually harassed by male guests. I'm over 76% of nurses being verbally assaulted, kicked, bitten, grabbed, and sexually harassed by patients and visitors while on the job. I am so over that one in five women factory workers in Cambodia have experienced coercion or harassment. I am over 60% farm workers sexually abused so much that their place of work is called Campo de Calzón, Field of Panties. I am over hundreds of thousands of women in Congo waiting for the rapes to end and their rapists to be held accountable. I am over the thousands of women in Bosnia, Myanmar, Guatemala, South America, Sierra Leone, Nigeria, Iraq, Syria, Cambodia, you name any place, still waiting for justice. I am over one in three women in the U.S. military being raped by their so-called comrades. I am over the fact that half of all transgender people and lesbians will experience sexual violence. I am over the fact that 75% of women in prison have histories of severe physical abuse by an intimate partner and 82% suffered severe physical or sexual abuse as children and they're being further punished rather than healed. I am over college campuses being places women survive rather than places they thrive because of rape culture. I am over the forces that deny women who have been raped to have the right to have an abortion. I'm over so-called developed countries still debating the legality of a woman choosing why should she should be able to have an abortion. I am over rape victims becoming re-raped when they go public. I am over women still being silent about rape because they are made to believe that it's their fault. Because they did something to make it happen. Like wear the wrong clothes. Because they are terrified that they won't get the part or the job or ever work again. 
I am over people not understanding that rape is not a joke. I am over being told that I do not have a sense of humor, that women do not have a sense of humor, when most women I know, and I know a lot, are really fucking funny. We just don't think being forced to watch a vile, powerful man masturbate in front of us to keep or get a job or having an uninvited penis up our anus or a vagina, a laugh riot. I am over women having to leave their homes when their husbands beat them. I am over women's safety not being a number one international priority when one out of three women will be raped or beaten in her lifetime. The destruction, muting, and undermining of women is the destruction of life itself. No women. No future. Duh! I am over the endless resurrection of the careers of rapists and sexual exploiters, like corporate executives, world leaders, priests, rabbis, shamans, film directors, actors, doctors, athletes, you name it. While the lives of those women they violated are often devastated and forcing them to live in social and emotional exile. I am over listening to a predator who has slept with and then married his stepdaughter express empathy for a mutual predator. I'm over years and years of being over rape and rewriting and updating this piece over it. I am over thinking about rape every single day since I was five years old. I am over getting sick by rape. I am over getting depressed by rape. I am over getting enraged by rape. I am over reading my insanely crowded inbox of rape horror stories every hour of every fucking day. I am over being polite about rape. We have been too understanding. It has been too long now. We must end it now. We need people to truly try and imagine once and for all, what it feels like to have your body invaded, your mind splintered, your soul shattered. Really, truly, deeply, I am over the passivity of good men. Where the hell are you? You live with us, you work with us, you make love with us, you befriend us, you father us, you brother us. You get nurtured and mothered and eternally supported by us. So why aren't you standing with us? Why are you not driven to madness and action by the rape, harassment, degradation, and humiliation of us? So why aren't you rising in droves, going beyond apologies and confessions, realizing that this issue is your issue, not ours? Why can't you see it, that if you were to stand as one fierce band of consistent, loving men, calling out to your brothers, speaking to your brothers, interrogating yourselves, dismantling patriarchy in every boardroom, hospital, hotel, school, locker room, farm, office, whatever, this whole thing would change overnight. There are approximately one billion women on this planet who will be raped or sexually assaulted in their lifetimes. One billion women. May isang abilyones nga babae. Un billion de mujeres. Isang billion kababaihan. Eine billionen frauen. Un milliard de femmes. Un billion de mujeres. Ian Milliard Froa. So train with one lien there. Can we rise together? Can we change the paradigm? Can we rebirth the culture? Because we know that when women are equal, free, safe, and allowed to be alive in all of their intensity, the whole story will finally change. <laughs>